right, thanks. So, welcome everybody. This is the highest Main Street Waterfront Historic District Commission. It's July 5th, 2023, 6.30 p.m. I hope everybody had a fabulous 4th of July. To all persons deemed interested or affected by the Town of Barnstable's Highness Main Street Waterfront Historic District Commission Ordinance under Chapter 112, Article 3 of the Code of the Town of Barnstable, you are hereby notified that a hearing will be held by remote participation methods at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, July 5th, 2023. The meeting will be televised by Channel 18 and may be viewed via the Channel 18 website at http streaming85.townofbarnstable.us backslash cablecast public site backslash. Real-time access to the media is available utilizing the Zoom link or telephone number and meeting ID provided below. Link https backslash backslash townofbarnstable-us us or by the hyphen us.zoom.us backslash j backslash 815-230-75271. Meeting ID 815-230-75271 on US toll free treble eight four seven five double four double nine. I am going to call this meeting to order. Um, alternate members, Commissioner Kevin Matthews. I'm here. And Commissioner Cornelius Cowley. Present. Cowley. Uh, uh, members, Commissioner Jennifer Hinckley Needham. Uh, uh, Commissioner Matt Clark. Here. Commissioner Laura Cronin. <laughs> Commissioner Tom Doherty. Here. Commissioner and Vice Chair Jack Kay. Here. Commissioner and Chair Cheryl Powell. I am also here. We do have quorum. I also believe that we have one of our town council liaisons. Or they are all very valuable to us. Town Councilor Betty Lucky, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Do I have any other town councilors? I have not. Looking around the room is one thing. Looking on my computer screen is something else. Doesn't look like we do at the, at the moment. Um, so welcome to everyone. We also have some special guests tonight. So I'm not going to go over the trainings. Just to, if you have not done your conflict of interest training, please do so. Also, Matt and uh, Cornelius, the, you are supposed to do at some stage the conflict of interest training. You can always contact Cynthia Lovell and she'll advise you on that. Nothing on awards or correspondence that I know of. Don't need to do purpose and procedure tonight. So we only have one thing of business tonight. And what I'm going to do is to invite uh, Jim to tell us a little bit about what we're going to hear and what this is about for those who have not been to these other meetings. And then we're going to introduce the people who are going to be speaking to us tonight. Excellent. Thank you, Cheryl. That was that was a great introduction. Um, so tonight's uh, our first opportunity to take a look at what we're calling the Downtown Hyannis Unified Design Guidelines and Regulations. And I feel like that title keeps expanding over over the course of our yes. our uh, development of this. But uh, so. You know, as I, I mentioned to this group uh, several months ago now, maybe six or seven months ago, you know, uh, we've heard, uh, you know, some of the concerns from the, the commission regarding, you know, the the the, the current uh, standards and guidelines that we have in place. Um, and in addition, we thought uh, with those concerns, the timing was right because of all the great uh, development that has uh, transpired for our downtown high end is zoning. Uh, with our zoning, we have created, you know, this form based uh, code uh, really for our main streets and, and our downtown as a whole. Um, and that already starts to touch on some design standards. Um, and with that, you know, those design standards kind of blend into our our local historic commission's uh, design standards, but also our planning board, which has their own design and infrastructure plan standards, um, but they don't really talk to each other. So our goal, uh, one of our goals uh, in this unified design uh, standards is, is to do that, is to do just that, to really speak with one voice moving forward. Um, and then it's also to kind of, you know, learn from our past activities, um, and what, you know, what has been some strengths, what has been some weaknesses, sorry about that, and, um, and, and really build on it. So what we've done, um, over the, the course of several months now is invite, uh, or have been lucky enough to work with our, our team at UTL, uh, Tim, Andrea, and, and Lauren have been, uh, a phenomenal resource, uh, for us to, 
start to build upon our design guidelines and and kind of learn what, what kind of framework we have in place and what we can um, you know do better. Um, we've we've met with the, the the util team over the course of these six months uh, on a regular basis, uh, and we did a a, a day long uh, kind of walking workshop with a number of uh, stakeholders, uh, a few members from this commission, a few members from the planning board, uh, some of our town councilors, and others that joined us, uh, even joined us on the walk. Um, and with that, you know, really started to touch on. Uh, taking pictures and developing out what are some strengths of, of our our district and what are some weaknesses. Um, and our team at UTL, again, uh, took all that information and really brought it, brought it together uh, to what you what you have here tonight, a draft, uh, a first draft, I should state, of, of these unified design guidelines and regulations. This is meant as a discussion tonight. We're going to hear from UTL, uh, give a, a brief presentation, but really... Uh, the, the meat of this meeting is to really get your guys' uh, sense of what's what's in this that you like, what are some things that are clearly missing, what things we could do better. Um, and the goal here is to, to build off of that conversation, make a better draft, and bring it back to you. Um, over time, we will also bring it back to the planning board for their review. And obviously, the public as a whole has to have an opportunity to really weigh in as well. So, this is our first uh, go at it, um, and I hope that you have a, had an opportunity to take a peek at it, and um, and we can have a good conversation tonight. So if it's okay, uh, Cheryl, uh, I can hand it off to Tim and his team, and uh, they have a brief presentation for us. Before you do that, I want to welcome Commissioner Cronin, who has arrived. Thank you. Uh, yes, that'd be fine. If you wouldn't mind uh, if, uh, introducing yourself and telling us a little, you know, starting it off, Tim. Great. Uh, my name is Tim Love. I'm a principal at UTL. Um, I've worked with many of the people who are attending tonight on um, a kind of rough draft outline of the guidelines. Um, uh, enjoyed the kind of walk around that we did one day. And we had maybe one, maybe two meetings with the steering committee to um, to run some things by them. I'm joined by uh, Andrea, who's the project manager for the project. Um, there's Andrea and and Lauren um, and uh, Lauren and I are going to be doing the presentation tonight, which is really to set uh, kind of contextualize the document that, that you got to understand um, the logic for what's in it, what's not in it, um, and to point out some important ways that it bridges from the new zoning to a um, slightly more refined list of requirements that both the planning board and the historic commission are meant to use for for project review. So I think without further ado, um, Lauren, if you can share the slides. Just want to check that everybody could see my screen. Yeah, all set. Perfect. That's good. <laughs> nice cars. <laughs> okay. So um, again, I'm going to... Um, review the role of the regulations and guidelines. Um, we've introduced the word regulations into the document, and we, I think, have it backwards from the way you described it, Jim. We're calling them regulations and guidelines because regulations are a little bit more stringent in terms of the procedures, which we can talk about. Um, I'm going to review where the regulations and guidelines apply um, with a map. And then Lauren's going to walk through um, not all of the guidelines, because as you can see, it's a, it's a rather comprehensive document, but point out some key features of it so that when you look at it in detail, if you hadn't had a chance to yet, you'll understand uh, how the parts fit together. And then at the end, we'll talk about next steps. So um, as Jim said, um, the document is now called the Unified um, Design Regulation and Guidelines. And we can, and Lauren's going to talk a little bit about what's a regulation and what's a guideline and why, and what it means in terms of, um, in particular, um, the way that the Historic Commission considers those uh, requirements as part of your deliberations. Um, so I, I, I think, uh, first of all, the guidelines have been custom designed, custom conceived to bridge off the existing zoning. Um, uh, when, I, when we introduced the project way back when, we talked about how that might work. I'm going to review those slides again because I think it's an important touch point for the project. Um, uh, the point of the the 
regulations and guidelines is to coordinate the review and approval of projects by mm -hmm. the commission, the planning board, and the town staff. So everybody is working from the same um, set of expectations that's going to send a clear message to the market, developers, their architects, builders, about what the expectations are, which will mean that um, the staff, the historic commission, and the planning board get better projects to review, hopefully. That's the point of the of the guidelines, to um, have better projects show up that might speed up approval in some cases, but also equally importantly will uh, mean, mean that the sum of separate projects will add up to something more than the sum of the parts. Um, the guidelines are also, as they're defined, design guidelines um, with shared expectations across projects so that as sites are redeveloped, especially sites that don't really contribute to the walkability of Hyannis today, um, as projects are built uh, from one to the next through their aesthetics, through their positioning on the site, through the way their massing, the mass is broken down, um, uh, there'll be some consistency across the projects um, to um, create an overall look and feel for the village. Um, so um, in terms of how we set up the outline for them, we looked at all of the design standards that are already embedded in the zoning. And there are quite a few in the new form-based zoning more than typical zoning that set some qualifications that already point in the direction of better built outcomes than a zoning code that's only based on units per acre or floor area ratio. Um, and then we said, what's missing from the zoning? How can we extend the, the, the design standards in the zoning uh, to a higher level of detail? And in some cases, that list of things on the right if they're in black, is to provide more detail on components and considerations that are already in the zoning. And then those things that are in red on the right, those other things that we think uh, should be built into the design guidelines that aren't included in the zoning. And this has proven to be a fairly robust framework um, for the, the regulations and guidelines themselves, both, both for the outline of the of the document, which we discussed with the steering committee relatively recently, and for the full draft that you see. Uh, so these are the building considerations, um, what's already in the zoning on the left, what's in the design guidelines and regulations on the right next. Um, uh, the existing design guidelines have a lot of requirements about parking lots and parking. So we made that um, a whole piece of the, the current draft. Um, again, some of those dimensional and design regulations are already in the zoning on the left. Those things that we augmented are on the right and are included in um, the design regulations and guidelines. Um, and last but not least, um, site and landscape considerations. Um, again, those things that are already in the zoning on the left. Um, and then those things that we thought should be drilled into or added um, and included in the uh, regulations and guidelines on the right. Um, because the guidelines and regulations point to each other, we've also included those aspects of the zoning that are related to guidelines and regulations in the text to make it easy for builders, architects, developers, land use attorneys to cross-reference both the document um, that we're talking about tonight and the zoning so there isn't any ambiguity about how they work together. Um, as for where um, the regulations and guidelines will um, uh, be enforced, um, it's really um, um, for the, the planning board it's in all of the areas that are um, uh, highlighted in um, the larger color, but for the historic commission, it's those areas that are within the dashed red line, which is the uh, which is the boundaries of the of the historic district. And so, most of the area where the zoning is affected, 
um, it also falls under the jurisdiction of um, uh, this document, uh, at least when it's approved anyway. So I think with that, I'll turn it over to Lauren to talk about um, the difference between regulation and guidelines and then provide a kind of high level overview of um, how we've thought about, about them. Thanks, Tim. All right. So uh, as Tim mentioned, and as many of you might already be familiar, we've uh, divided the document essentially into two buckets. Um, so starting with regulations, which uh, we've placed up front, those are items that we think are really important to establish as requirements um, so that they ensure a certain standard uh, uniformly across all new development. Um, so there would need to be a waiver uh, in order to to vary from what we have here. Um, so just some examples of, of what a regulation might be. We might use language that say, you know, says a certain type of material is prohibited or that uh, a building a facade maximum length must be a certain number of feet um, before uh, having any kind of variety in the uh, offset or shape of massing. Um, so this, this is all language that we think is really important to establish up front. And you'll notice that we have a, a lot less here in this overview than we have in the bucket uh, of design guidelines on the right. Um, and that's because the bulk of the document still is about design guidelines. Um, and the design guidelines are really meant to be um, discretionary language that will help guide aspects of development that relate to um, materiality, color, um, that really are more about look and feel of development. Um, so I'm gonna go through some examples in more detail. Um, we did also want to acknowledge that we have gotten a lot of feedback from you all, and we really appreciate all the recommendations that were made. So, Tom, you might rec uh, recognize some of these on the screen here. We wanted to show that we've taken everything into consideration, and we're certainly doing our best to incorporate as many of these as possible. Um, so this slide uh, literally highlights uh, which areas we've taken your recommendations for moving items from the guidelines to the regulations. Um, and so we, we've taken quite a bit and um, tried to standardize and make, you know, as many of them regulations as we thought made sense. Um, so just to go over a few examples, um, we've taken language about building form. So no more than two massings may be oriented in the same direction for a single building complex. And language like that is going to help ensure that you don't have monotonous building forms um, one after the other. It's going to ensure a variety and make sure that you have uh, architectural distinction among uh, the new development that you see. We've also um, taken language um, related to the parking. Um, that's to encourage positive urban design. So we have have we now have language that says parking lots shall be located to the rear of structures at the interior of a block. And that's going to help encourage a more active street edge. Um, we've additionally made regulations um, language about gutters and downspouts being the same color as the trim or white. Uh, and then you might see in pink on the slide, we're adding language. Um, basically, in, for some instances, um, in order to convert some of this into guidelines, we, we took what I'll call fluffier language, like discourage, encourage, um, and made them a bit stronger so that we can enforce them or make them enforceable in the regulations. So vinyl windows are discouraged are now vinyl windows are prohibited. That's just an example of how we've been taking some of these items and, and making them regulations within the document. Now, certainly the commission can grant a waiver, but you can't grant, grant a waiver until unless we prohibit things in the regulations. Um, and we've left the more discretionary language in the guidelines, you know, preferred X, Y, Z, because the the guidelines are, are meant to be a little bit are 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 a baseline for your conversations um, uh, in ways that are meant to be more flexible. Correct. Are we are we permitted to interrupt at all? That's Jim's call. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you see something as as Lauren's going through, please feel free to highlight it. Absolutely. Well, the very last item on this page has become something I've looked into extensively, 
And the PV panels to match the roof cover seems to be a real problem. Everyone I've talked to in the industry say you get black or nothing. That so does is that an mean that point, all of us are going to have a problem with that? That is a really great point. And, and I'll let Andrea chime in if I miss something here. But we've, we've talked to our in-house sustainability expert. And um, for that reason, as you've noted, the... Um, the photovoltaic panels only come in a limited array of colors, and we certainly don't want to discourage, you know, homeowners from seeking sustainable options. Um, so we did not end up making that a regulation, and that's why it's not highlighted. Oh, all right. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it would certainly be ideal um, to have everything, you know, be as consistent in the same color as possible so that they don't necessarily attract lots of attention. But Again, we didn't want to enforce that quite literally. All right, so I will keep moving on. Um, this is an example um, of a regulation that we've made around building form. And this is meant to break down larger masses and have, uh, again, kind of uh, ensure that you're going to get larger masses broken down into smaller um smaller portions of a building. And this is going to make it feel more contextual and more in keeping with the scale of development, certainly, that you see around Hyannis um, and in the downtown area. So we have language now and regulations that relate to the overall massing, facade length, and rhythm. Um, and this is an example of a drawing that we've uh, included within the regulations um, to illustrate what we mean by that. So um, just to explain it a little further, um, the language that we uh, touched upon earlier about no more than two massings may be oriented in the same direction for a single building complex. So here's how that could potentially play out. Um, if we consider this all one building complex, here you can kind of more literally understand what we mean by that. So that you end up having more variety within, you know, a building complex on what I would say is a larger lot like this one is. Uh, we also have language that ensures um, that when you're offsetting uh, multiple massings of the same building complex, that you're always doing it by at least seven feet. That's going to allow for it to feel like a proper break, um, but it also means that you can have balconies and those might be able to nicely uh, relate and take up space um, adjacent to that gap. And then another thing that I'll help explain is we have language um, that says that the facade of any building greater than 100 feet in width must be divided vertically by a recess or offset of at least seven feet. Again, that's to help break down larger masses and to ensure that you don't end up with buildings that are excessively long. Um, so you can see here this length is 100 feet and at that point, the rest of the building mass steps back seven feet. Um, this could also be interpreted as a seven by 10 foot uh, recess. Um, and that would look essentially like a, like a divot within the building form. Um, we also have language within this, again, to further break down the scale and make, make it more contextual, that facades shall be no wider than 50 feet without a change in roof shape and height and a change in material or wall plane. Um, and so again, that's to really break down the scale, make it feel more in keeping with um, the scale of development that you see commonly around Hyannis. Um, and Cheryl, I see you have a question. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing, what, what is the um, amount that you're getting the footage for the, from the front, line, front lot line to the curb? That's all handled, Cheryl, in the zoning code, the setbacks. Yeah. And so, Do you know what that is at the moment? It, uh, yeah, so that, that's going to be, there's actually a maximum setback now in our downtown. So that you can't go, I believe it's, uh, it might be, it's, it might be three, it's pretty, it's pretty minimal. It's, I think it's two or three feet uh, from the front, set, uh, front lot line. This is a little bit different in terms of, uh, you know, staggering. I think, what Lauren's getting to is um, the whole discussion that the commission has gotten 
to uh, a number of times in terms of building form. What does that, what does that really mean in terms of our design review? And, uh, and I think we've, we've run into a couple uh, roadblocks over time. And I think, uh, you know, I asked uh, the, these guys to, to take a close look at that. And I, you know, I think they, they've done a great job with this part. The reason I bring it up is because on, for instance, on main street, it's very tightly packed down there. And, with the seven foot setback and then the curve quite often that's already right at the front door of any prop any property that's there it's true but i don't think cheryl um on main street itself there are any lots that are maybe there's a couple of cases where the facade would be wider than 100 feet yeah and so this is a th that's this is I trying mean. to that's what i mean yeah, yeah th 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 this is showing all of the combos in one diagram, but the the rule in that case is that if you had a facade that's 80 feet wide, then you'd have to change the material and or the facade um, every yeah. 50 feet. You wouldn't have to do all of the other moves that are happening with the other masses. But I think it's a good question. We might we might think about breaking this diagram into two diagrams or something. It's trying to show all of the all of the rules in one place. And I guess there there may be some sites where a building would be this big, but um, I, I think there's, there's zero lot line buildings on uh, lots on Main Street are never wider than 100 feet. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. But it's a really good question though. And I, and I, I do think that, that <clears throat> this diagram might be confusing relative to the allowable maximum setback in the zoning. So we should, I think, team Util and Jim, we should just think about that so it doesn't become a question with people. And uh, Jess, I am here. I'm just going to go over there and close the door real quick and come back, but I am listening. We won't There's decide anything while you're gone. <laughs> Is it also I, possible? It's, it's just if the breeze coming, I don't like to slam and scare everybody. Is it also possible that when you have the seven foot offset from the first item on the left to the second, could you then bring the third one back forward to try and solve the, the cascade setback. toward the wrong property line and cut somebody off? Because well, that I the mean, opposite I think, end of this, the opposite side of these buildings is shrinking and growing with the offsets. So I don't know how we could come up with a compromise for those that have to stagger them and not have them be. Yeah, they could they could they could they could step Jack back out to the to the setback line. And then that pocket could be an, ent an entry patio or yeah. cafe area. You know, th th this is maybe more uh what might make sense if we imagine that main street is actually on the far end of this depiction and then that's mm -hmm. a side street that would be a nice massing then because then the setback would increase as you're running back away from right. the frontage um or on barnstable road or something you know so i think we were yeah. thinking about it more that way that the the front might be on the on, on the far end of this, and then this is how the mass might break down. There's a couple of new development proposals that that have a frontage on on Main Street, but run back pretty far. And I, I think that's what we were thinking about a little bit with this passing. Yeah, I'm thinking some of our our architects that work in this area are going to want to see some forgiveness with their particular site, so it would avoid a an appeal right yeah yeah and i i think that that they could um they could ask for a waiver and then you could consider the actual case against these regulations mm. well, it's it, it's a question i think for the commission about um uh, you know it's, it's a discussion uh we've had with jim a couple of times now which is regulations just make builders developers and architects work a little harder to try the rules before they come to you and uh, you know i think it's good practice if there's a, a good design solution even if a waiver is required it's it's 
it's caused a little, it's, it requires a little bit more effort on the part of the project proponent to try the regulations first and, and, and maybe make a more rigorous case about why they have a better idea. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. And I like the idea of the regulation simply because, mm -hmm. it, as you pointed out, it makes them work harder. There is an opportunity for a waiver if they can make a good enough case for it. But it, it, it gets out of this, uh, how do you interpret it? The regulation is a regulation. And after that, if you get a waiver, you get a waiver. But it, it, it makes it, um, you don't have as many trying to say, well, I could do this or I could do that. And, you know, it, it, it tightens it up and makes it clear. And, and I want to come back to, you know, I, I, what, what the regulation is the writing, not the picture. The picture is just meant to help explain one solution. Um, but I, I liked uh, Jack's scenario, which is, you know, it would, it would, it might be hard to solve architecturally, but you could have the third mass back at the setback line and then the seven foot offset would be in the middle of the mass of the building. Um, it would be hard to solve the roof for that. But, uh, you know, I think, um, I think it's also true that you might you might try these for uh, a year or two and have us back. <laughs> <laughs> we we shouldn't make the um, the perfect the enemy of the good. Actually, you could almost put that in as to, uh, a review at a certain time in the future or something yeah. like that. And we would accumulate the... Uh, because, yeah, because what we... we what, shoveling blocks. And, and we've, been, we've been doing that with, with Jim and the town team. We've been looking at projects that are in the pipeline now and um, kind of a little bit using the logic to think through some of these, these, re these regulations and guidelines. So... Um, and anyway, ponder this because um, we've maybe given it too much thought. So fresh eyes are always useful. Should we keep moving ahead, Cheryl? Yeah. I try not to interrupt. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. I'm trying to keep it mine on mute as much as possible so that I do not you do not hear rustling papers or my pen or anything. No worries. Um, so next we have uh, design regulations um, related to facade treatment. Um, so this involves such things as materials. So we've uh, prohibited aluminum or vinyl siding as well as EFIS systems. Um, we've also uh, now added um, the Nantucket Historic District Commission approvable colors. Uh, as the color palette um, within the regulation, just because we thought that would be a great starting point, um, given the context. Um, and we might also want to consider um, certain colors from the historic New England um, paint company. I know that the Beacon Hill uh, Historic Commission uses that guide, and there might be colors from particular time periods that might be appropriate for consideration as well. So that's something certainly that we would um, like to hear your input on. Um, but on the screen um, right now, these are uh, a snippet of the Nantucket historic colors, um, just so you have an idea. Um, we also have language around prohibiting vinyl windows, and we also have language about frontage zones. Um, for instance, restricting uh, plastic and other certain materials for shop front awnings. Uh, I think this can might be the- Can I possibly ask that? When it says certain materials, is that covered elsewhere in there? But certain- Yes, in the, in the, it's Cheryl, in the document itself, there's, there's much more detail. This is okay. a, just a kind of overview of things that we're covering. Okay, that's. I just wanted to make sure that because certain kind of yeah, how long yeah. Is it be? excellent. Thank you. How many colors are you really thinking about? Like, is this all in Nantucket colors that they have to offer in Nantucket, and we're going to add more? This is the full list from Nantucket, right, Andrea and, and Lauren? Yes. 
Hmm. Yes. This is the full list. This is yeah. the full list. Uh, and we're, and we're thinking of adding more colors, or it's it's under it's it's for you all to consider. Okay. Yeah, and Tom, for what me, what? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. You know, for me, I'd like to you know, like when I look at the colors that we have right now, it's you know, it's uh, makes you dizzy. Uh, where I think we should limit it as much as possible, you know, and uh, you know, I, I I think this color palette's great, uh, personally. Uh, but when you put a color palette like this together, you also have a white in here that you use for trim, or this is just the body colors, or there's no white That's right. color? That's so right. What, so white is in it. Okay. All right. No, I, I just think, you know, I think this color palette's great. Maybe I, I just wouldn't go too, I, I just hope we keep it limited, you know, where we don't have that big list that we have right now. And, Tom, and I like the idea you brought up the white. And Tom, I was I wanted to throw it out to the commission and maybe you guys just mull it over and think about it and get back to me. But uh, this list here, I think is, yeah, I agree, it's an excellent color. And so I was trying to think of ways to incentivize this list being used. And so we have in the document, you'll see uh, a, a small section about the standards for review. And one of them is administrative review. And my thought is if we do, so administrative review in here is just replacement of in kind. So basically repairs of exactly what you got. But my thought is maybe also for like color, for instance, they can paint their, their building the same color they have or white. Or if you choose one of these 10 colors, it's an administrative review as well. So they come in, they have their paint swatch. I say, okay, it meets the, the requirement of the Nantucket color chart. You're, you're approved administratively. That gives them an incentive to pick one of those as opposed to, uh, we could have in the regulation, historic New England paint color of America, which is, which is, you know, historic New England, you know, uh, paint, paints from across Massachusetts. Uh, but, um, and so they would have to come and get your approval, which, you know, involves, uh, a check, uh, two two week waiting period, uh, meeting, you know, all that. Where so that that builds into the, the the permitting process. Where if we uh, add in this this ten uh, swat swashes or so as uh, administrative review, maybe that's that's uh, incentive enough. I don't know. Just just want to toss that out there for you guys. Thought. Could there be language included potentially that differentiates between like a a body color and an and an accent color? I feel like we've gotten hung up a few times on someone saying, "Well, it's on the list," and they're going to paint their whole building lime green, for example. When clearly that that seems to me like it should be a accent color, not something that you're bathing your entire building in. Um, We can look into that, and I th and we can look for precedent for how that's handled. And I and I do think it's related to Tom's question about acceptable trim colors and then body colors. Uh, I'm pre I'm pretty sure that these are mostly body colors, um, or accent colors for doors. Um, and I think some of them might be interchangeable. Some of these colors seem more appropriate for doors or shutters. Um. But maybe not trim. Like the dark greens are uh, the greens are a classic shutter color. So maybe Lauren and Andre, we can see if there's any qualification about how these colors are used beyond the color palette itself. Certainly, we can look into that. And I think off the top of my head, um, the historic New England guide does uh, denote when things should when color should be used as trim versus body. Um, so we can look to that for inspiration as well when we think of um, what recommendation we have for how these colors are used. I, I wonder yeah. if that palette maybe supersedes then the Nantucket one, and then it might be a process of elimination from that. It might be a reduced version of that because it might be an easier resource. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll take these questions back and think through this a little bit more. I think, yeah, that would be what I would suggest as well, um, the clarification, because right now it's it's kind of 
you know, there's not like when you do the massing of the building fronts and facades, you know, especially when you're on Main Street, um, having that historic look, having all one color on the front, especially if they do that lime green is not necessarily, um, it might be in the color palette, but it, it, we have to kind of consider what it looks like if it's all that color and then have some requirements in there for, um, selecting a trim versus just leaving it all the same color. Um, is there something that other historic villages or areas have in there, like a, a facade color and trim colors, and then how much of that can be all one color? Yeah, to your point, Commissioner Cronin, I was gonna mention, like we're supposed to be the pinnacle here in Hyannis, at least in my opinion, but you look at Main Street Centerville or Main Street Osterville or portions of 6A, it seems very protected to me, you know, mainly whites and black, maybe a little bit of red in there. And um, yeah, you come down Main Street and it's like a, you know, a Rubik's cube in certain places, just all these different colors next to each other and two re meetings in recent memory where the, the logic's been like, well, they're all pink across the street, so I have to be all green now, so I stand out. And then the next person comes in and is like, well, they're all green, so I need to be all yellow, so I stand out. And you just have all these buildings that are, uh, it starts to look very not uniform. Um, so if these smaller villages are, you know, I don't know if there's an ordinance in place or if there's just kind of an agreement to really protect the look and feel of those places, but um, it feels a lot more uniform uh, in both building materials and color to me when I drive through those places on the on the way into town each day. <clears throat> and the other clarification on this would be, um, this is different than what would be available for sign colors or would they both be the same? Uh, question. Uh, Jim, I have, my I have a question for you, Jim, on the uh, design standard review applicability on page 12. You said that this says that the Hyannis Main Street Waterfront Historic District Commission shall have a designee. But it indicated your statement was that the planning department would be the designee for that. So there's a, I'm a little confused about that. If well, we so, are going to yeah. have a designee, we're never going to have an agreement. Yep. So that's from the ordinance. That's from uh, uh, the the general ordinance that the historic commission would have a designee. That doesn't have to be planning department. That could be chair. Uh, that could be whatever this commission so chooses. But that's uh, that is from the ordinance that there is supposed to be administrative review. So what happens right now, practically speaking, if someone comes in and wants to say replace a roof um, and with the exact same on the exact same footprint and exact same colors and they're doing just you know there was asphalt shingle they're putting asphalt shingle down we say okay that that's that's okay that's administrative approval but if they are doing anything that changes anything uh that's not exactly in kind then we uh, immediately kick it to uh the commission uh so that's what the administrative review is right now uh but you know right now we don't have a designee uh, right. Commission. No, the designee is staff right now. That's how, from the original guidelines, that's how it was spelled out. Uh, no, that, but the, that's very confusing. Right. So, yeah. So this is how it operates now. In kind, size, color, material. If there's any degree of change, it goes to uh, the commission for review. I believe Commissioner Cronin had a question. I'm not sure it got answered, but she's just stepped out. But we want to be sure to address that question when she comes back. We could, please. <clears throat> oh, we don't have to wait for her. Though. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep going unless anybody uh, else has. <clears throat> nope. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so next we have uh, regulations around parking um, and the intent, as we said earlier, is really to encourage positive urban design and make sure that you have active edges along streets. Um, so the language that we have for this is to, um, if possible, place uh, parking and loading away from the front lot line um, and to the rear of a lot uh, behind a building. And so this diagram um, shows uh, 
many things that we're trying to illustrate uh, within the document. So uh, accessing the parking lot, um, ideally from uh, an adjacent parking lot and not from the street if possible. Um, and uh, making the access to parking and loading from primary streets prohibited. So that's where we're getting, you know, the regulation language from. So prohibiting access from this primary street when there is a potential to access it from a secondary street. Uh, we are likewise trying to encourage shared use of parking lots um, so that we can uh, reduce the amount of parking uh, when possible. Um, between multiple developments on adjacent par parcels. Commissioner Cronin, did you have a question that did not get answered or did I, not, did I see that wrong? Uh, on this, no, on the building, I'm fine. I had a question on the parking. But did that get answered? Yes, it did. It did, okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so moving uh, forward. I just go back to the parking? How, right now we have shared parking lots behind Main Street which has created tremendous safety problems and and ownership problems of who's responsible for it. How does that resolve that if that if that is assume that the those buildings that are there now are going to develop? How does the town get involved or what part of the town ownership of the parking lot that they say can't be done or the private owners? How do we avoid that from happening? Because I, I don't see that just saying you encourage shared, shared parking lot, which makes sense, but I don't see how it encourage it to be maintained or who's responsible for it at the end of the day. That's really a question for Jim. Uh, you know, I think the design regulations and guidelines are, are really focused on aesthetics and not these complicated ownership issues. I mean, the shared parking is the reason that Main Street works. Um, I, I think if the parking all got back in its precise lane, you know, it because it's kind of supply and demand through, you know, through a kind of understanding of, amongst the property owners in the town means that there's usually parking somewhere back there. And, and that gets into a whole other set of issues that we've been involved with in the past. More, more recently, uh, the towns had consultants look at that issue. So I don't know, Jim, if you want to comment on that. Yeah, so I could comment. Yeah, uh, to Tim's point. Yeah, for for our purposes here, I mean, shared shared use of parking lots, I think, is an ideal situation, and and why I think we suggested put putting it in regulation. But in terms of uh, yeah, the practicality, the operations of it, if there is a new development that's looking to share parking, it's actually a special permit from the planning board. Uh, so with that, the planning board would ask for, you know, what do you have, what do you have for an agreement in place? Uh, for instance, we, uh, they recently reviewed one for that, actually that same parking lot, North Street parking lot. And that was a license through the town. And so there's a shared agreement there. Obviously the North Street parking lot, that big one, that's, that's mainly the town's, uh, issue that we need to deal with about making it better and, uh, you know, improving. It. And we are working towards that. That's actually one of the projects that I have, I've been uh, tasked to try and solve. Uh, so I'll be working on that one. Uh, but yeah, for our purposes, I think, you know, uh, it's, this is a good practice to continue as opposed to siloing it out, just like um, right where the, uh, the old bank was right at the corner of that winter street and main street, how they, they said they took, they packed their bags and went home and, and carved it off on, on North Street, unfortunately. Um, I think it would be good to continue to uh, work as, as good neighbors and, and share the parking. All right, I think I'm gonna move on to guidelines if, if that's all right. Okay, so uh, we have guidelines uh, around a multiple different things in this document. Um, so starting with this roof types example, um, the drawing on the left um, illustrates instances where we think flat roofed components are appropriate um, on pitched roof structures. So this particular example is showing uh, flat roof shed dormer, uh, bay window and projecting storefront just as examples. Um, we also 
within the document have interspersed some annotated images and, and we'll be planning to add a few more um, from the first draft that you saw. Uh, the image on the right is uh, depicting an example of what we call a false front. Um, so this is an instance where the facade is extending upward beyond the roof line and is forming a tall parapet. And that's something that we want to discourage. Um, so in the document, you'll notice any time that we're discouraging something within the guidelines, um, we'll outline it in red and have this kind of red X in the corner. And any time that we're encouraging something, it'll be the opposite. We'll outline it in green and have a green check mark. Um, so you'll see a few examples of those as we continue through the slides. Um, and really the intent of this is to incentivize higher quality construction so that we're getting good outcomes um, that's the hope, at least from uh, submissions that you're receiving. Um, so here are some uh, good examples. Um, these are focused on facade treatment and fenestration, and these both happen to be the same project. Um, and this is something that we saw with a few of you when we did our um, our site walk. And um, this is a building that we we thought handled this really well. Uh, I think this is called the Sea Captain's Row Development. And what we like about it is the way that it's using uh, materiality to break down the scale of the building. So this is, you know, they're using a restricted palette. They're only using two kinds of materials, um, very muted, and that helps to break down uh, the scale of the development. And what's also nice is that it's, you know, hearkening back to traditional building materials. So this has cedar shakes on this side of the facade and it looks like some kind of um, siding, wood siding on the in the middle portion here. What we also like about this development, and this is something we've written into the guidelines, is that it's using two over two sash windows and it's got an exterior muntin. Um, so that's something that will still be energy efficient, but give the look and feel of a divided light. Um, so that's something that will kind of be more in keeping with historic context um, of, you know, older buildings around Hyannis. And by the way, that that three dimensional diagram that Lauren was showing earlier in the presentation, a lot of those a lot of those dimensions that we were looking at, the 100 feet, the 50 foot change of facade plane, uh, having multiple masses come together. Um, we we back check those against these buildings. That's a great point. All right, so back to an example we don't love. Um, we want to incentivize high quality construction, which means we do not want to see aluminum framing on storefront windows. Um, so this is an example where we are discouraging that. Um, there's other language that we have relative to shop fronts um, that we do want to encourage. For instance, uh, retractable and roll down awnings are encouraged. Uh, and we are also encouraging the use of transparent glazing um, and avoiding tinted glass. And, and we think that's going to uh, just improve the quality and uh, experience of uh, walking down main streets um, and it also just helps you see better into into the spaces, whether they're um, restaurants or active storefronts. Um, so that's something that we want to encourage. Um, now, moving on to parking design guidelines. Um, again, we want to encourage that there's proper amount of um, buffering and screening um, of the parking area and that uh, appropriate uh, landscapes are created to aid with that um, so that you don't end up, you know, walking down a street and being right next to a row of parked cars. So this is an example of where there's very minimal buffering of the parking area. So just having a lawn and a few trees here and there really isn't going to do much to help screen the parking area. Um, so that's why, you know, we're calling out this example as being inadequate. Um, so we think, you know, the zoning certainly has great language around screening parking. And so within the document, we have several footnotes that refer back to the zoning um, as a reference. But we've also 
added additional language on ways that you can uh, use vegetation and other screening measures to more effectively create distance uh, as a pedestrian from the parking area. So I'm gonna let Andrea and Jim speak to the next steps. Uh, great, thanks Lauren. Uh, so this is our first uh, meeting uh, with the with you all with the historic commission uh, we're going to be meeting with you all again in person on August 2nd uh, to view a revised draft and get feedback from you all again and right before that we're also going to meet with a planning board uh, on July 21st to view that same revised draft and get feedback and and uh, from from there after that I think the the intent here is to then kind of release it out to the public to see if there's anybody else that, you know, wants to provide input. Uh, we're certainly going to be sharing this with some of the stakeholders in downtown. And as as our uh, uh, as Tim and, and team mentioned, uh, we've been bouncing it off of conceptuals and and current projects that are already in place to to see how it, how it interacts. So, you know, making sure that these these actually work well. I will note, you know, it's certainly open for additional comments from this this group tonight. Uh, but I will note that there are several areas in the document where I've I've laid out some comments in the margins. Uh, so if you have an opportunity to take a peek, those are really meant to kind of be a conversation starter to get a sense of what you guys are, what am I, what I'm thinking, and and uh, get a sense from you guys. So if if you don't if you don't think of something tonight, you know, certainly this isn't your last opportunity. Please provide me with those comments, uh, you know, between now and August 2nd. Um, and then obviously we'll be back in, in August to uh, to uh, review that revised document. Now in August and the next step, we didn't go over lighting today and, and sidewalks. Is that all going to be done in August or? Uh... Well, there's there are some lighting criteria in the document and sidewalk and landscape in the document. I think uh, the team wasn't uh, planning on going step by step through each of them. Just you know, if there's anything that that pops out to you as you read this document, because uh, it is you know 17 pages of of guidelines and regulations. Uh, no, you know, there's no, yeah. I went through it, but I thought when we did our, our walk and we were taking pictures of lights that we don't like, to me, lighting is really important in a town. Uh, you know, are we going to uh, uh, put guidelines of, uh, you know, uh, up lighting? Are we going to do onion lights, coach lights? Uh, are we going to uh, disallow uh, certain types of lights? Are we just going to let it, let, just let it go to whatever, what, what anybody wants? Uh, in that same category, well, it's a different category, but the same light, is the lighting and walls we also focused on that were not mentioned here. I think there's a mention in the paperwork, but uh, will there be further regulations on this that are going to be proposed? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of information about cl allowable cladding um, materials in the document. And we, we, co we cover lighting, don't we, uh, Andre and Lauren? It is, but it's just not specific. You know, it's, yeah. uh, uh, you know, like we, we're going to we're going to be specific in the type of windows we're going to have and the type of doors we're going to have, uh, but we're not very specific as far as the lighting goes. I think we have language around encouraging, you know, historic lighting forms as appropriate. So the lantern um, and acorn style fixtures, uh, but I think we could certainly revisit and see how we can get more detailed. Yeah, I yeah, did we, not, and I read through it, and I did not see that being more specific, unless I uh, missed. Yeah, page thirty has it as a guideline, um, and but yeah, we can certainly work with the team to try and get some more specificity on that. Yeah, we um, it's it, when we when you get into lighting fixtures, we want to stay away from particular products. Yeah, and so th then the problem is that the descriptive terms for different kinds of lighting aren't universe that there aren't universally understood you know a, a coach light might you know so we we i think what we need to do is to make lighting important make clear that it needs to be of an appropriate scale and style um 
but I, this might be one place where the historic commission might have to use its discretionary taste to to make decisions. Um, the problem I, I've done guidelines in the past where you get much more specific, and then certain lines don't make certain lights anymore, and um, that's that's a harder thing to maintain. I, you know, I, I just read the last meeting. You know, we're doing all these regulations and guidelines, which I really love, and I liked everything I saw. <laughs> but, you know, lighting's important. And I think, Jim, we talked about it one time, like uh, getting coordinating with the town, uh, either having more lights than the trees, outside of what we're doing here. But uh, I really think the lighting should be addressed with the town or be some guidelines. You know, and you can have pictures of coach lights, you have pictures of onion lights, you know, for people to choose from, too, if we want to get more specific. I, I actually prefer that as well, but there's a little more specificity also than the rest. But I think that you've done a great job. Um, perhaps we could send some recommendations or something, Tom, if you what you had in mind. I think Commissioner Cronin had something. I saw your hand going up. And yeah, are, one more thing. Commissioner Matthews, I think afterwards you had, I think you were trying to say something. Thank um, you. With, with um, that in, in mind, as far as getting more specifics with regard to the storefront, like you showed an example of an aluminum door, but only also showed examples of the coverage of the windows and what is allowed from a path, you know, from a see-through. And I think that in our existing guidelines, I think there are some, you know, trying to make sure that they're not covered. In other words, you should be able to have visibility in seeing what is in the storefront and I think putting posters and handwritten notes on there um, I'd like to see see us get more specific on that one of the differences here um, hyenas and the other villages is that you do see that uniformity whether it's just lighting or or storefronts and I think um, we do have a kind of a mishmash where you can't even see inside other than advertising you know it's not even a, a it doesn't even look like a you know privacy screen or some sort um so if we could maybe take a looking at that and then the sidewalk themselves we have um racks of, of items currently which um were allowed f during covid which you know allowed some access uh, additional basically retail space for them and there are examples and i think at the I think existing, it says not not allowed. I think, could we take a look at that and put some regulations on there so we could have something allowable, but with regard to um, where it's placed. If you look at Mrs. Mitchell's uh, summer uh, sack on, down the end of um, Main Street, she has some very uh, nice racks she she rolls them out there in the day she's got printed signs no handwritten you know two for two dollars type of thing she has handwritten signs they're kind of a wooden font with uh, with the like a, a real nice clothing rack actually and then she's rolling them back in they're out of the way within her storefront um, whereas you go down further and you're back to the aluminum rolling racks you know all mishmashed around and they're out into the sidewalks um, so that the <laughs> pedestrian walk is not um, kind of where it, where it kind of should be. So if we could maybe take a look at those in more detail and really specify. Um, I think it's a, um, yeah. You know, the, these guidelines are for um, project review tied to capital projects, whether new construction or renovations. Um, some of the issues that are coming up are ongoing code enforcement um, uh, and that includes temporary signs that tenants put in and things. And I don't know if, if the town and the historic commission or the planning board, whose purview that would be to, is that ISD gym? It might, that that might be related. There might be some related ordinances and actions the town can take that don't belong in these design guidelines, but are, um, are, are parallel to what would be in these regulations and guidelines. Right, um, but I, I understand where, where Laura is coming from. And I, I think maybe we could have a discussion about maybe some, some opportunities we could do to include in here, but you're right, Tim, I, that much of it is uh, you know, enforcement and that, that is through inspectional services and, and building the building commissioners, ultimately the, 
enforcement officer there, but there might be some opportunities there. So we'll, we'll take a closer look, Laura. Yeah. And that might require a, a parallel ordinance that, that can then be enforced, Jim, which is certainly true in other communities. Commissioner Matthews, did you have something you wanted to say? I did have a, uh, a few things here. First of all, uh, being this is only my second meeting on the commission, this draft is great. Uh, the regulations, the guidelines, I think it uh, is a great building block for me personally to see exactly where we're going from here. And I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to get to read it and have it all in one place. Um, there are a couple of few points uh, in the draft that I when I read that I I just want to ask some questions about real quickly. Uh, one of them is on the and again, I don't have a page, the printed thing here doesn't have page numbers, but we're talking about the building design guidelines and regulations. Uh, part A is building form. Uh, and then B in that section is facade length and rhythm. And there's a two and a four talking about the piers, the pilasters and other features. Uh, they seem to me to be saying opposite things <laughs> so for one section of it says that the the architectural base should extend all the way to the ground or terminate at any horizontal articulation that defines the base but then in four it says it needs to be uninterrupted by horizontal articulation or anything uh, go to differentiate the base so those two seem opposite to me and i was confused by it and wanted to bring that up i think that's they a good call uh, that's a good call um and i we, we were looking at some of that finer grain language um, uh, earlier today. So I think that that, that warrants a, another pass through by us, awesome. especially when we get in, into that grain of architectural details. Um, it might be a little bit too prescriptive um, only because it might be hard to interpret then. And so some of the language might be more confusing than helpful. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, think, I think you zeroed in on exactly a, one of a couple of examples we were talking about. So Later on down the passage, I'm getting to a point where it talks about frontage types here, and it's shop fronts and window, awnings and canopies and window displays. And then you have something here in two and three, residential and mixed use. You have number one under both of those, but it's blank. So I don't know what you're trying to say there. Um, or if there's just, we missed those two. So I just wanted to make that, uh, you know, bring that up as well. And then the final thing is under site and landscape guidelines, it starts with B, vegetation, there is no A. So I don't know if the A was just forgotten or it just started with B instead of A or whatever. So just wanted to kind of bring that up as well. It, it might have gotten moved from guidelines to regulations or vice versa. Gotcha. Okay. I suspect. Okay. And and but, to that point, uh, sorry, Tim, I uh, didn't mean to cut you off, but it's just, um, I think the format and the numbering, I think we're going to take a closer look at that because each section probably needs to have its own I identification because over time, someone's going to want to cite, you know, section exactly. 24, A, 2, 9, whatever it may be. Exactly. But other than that, I'll be honest, again, with my second meeting with, with the committee, I thought that this was pretty in depth and I thought it was pretty transparent. There may be, again, without with my minimal experience, there may be more specifications needed that I d wouldn't know. And that's what's great about, you know, everybody being able to chip in and, and, and you know, talk about what they're feeling about it. But again, as a, a newbie coming in, I, I think it's a it's a really complete draft. And I uh, commend the work that you guys have, have done to put this all together. Yeah, great job. Uh, you, you, just, you just gained your good, all good catches. You just got your season back. Yeah, you can. <laughs> I, we we want you to look at the whole document again one more time. You were so good. <laughs> I will. <laughs> uh, I, I do. I do think, though, that all kidding aside, you know, I, I think that everybody who's been involved with this, you know, at least two meetings now. Um, and, and, you know, includes Matt's comments and certainly Tom's and Jack. I mean, there's a bit of consistency. We, 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 want, we, we want the guidelines to be narrow enough that, you know, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole or whatever the expression is. But in some cases, we, the, we might have gone a little bit too far. And so I think that um, we don't, we don't want to have – so many guidelines and regulations that that you lose the forest for the trees and you you don't you know that we want to make sure that the, that there are priority guidelines that things 
make things generally right, and there's super detailed ones that maybe are better left to a discretionary discussion. So I think that's a little bit the, the I'm take, that's how I'm taking your 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 excellent comments too. Are are some of these you know peers and where they rest and things like that. I, I don't know if that kind of language is so important when most of the buildings are going to be either shingles or clabbered with kind of standard trim. Do we need to be including language like that? Maybe not. I, I think Jack has I, 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 yeah, I've got a question with the, uh, unlike Tom, who's uh, focused <laughs> on lights, I'm focused on doors and windows. <laughs> and on our entry, I want to be a little stronger in my comments and say contemporary and metal, metal storefronts are not allowed. Mm -hmm. And it says in here, uh, repetitious and stuff like that. I don't think that statement is strong enough, what's in here on page 25. I want the... Uh, Contemporary and metal storefronts not allowed. It just um, that's second out. Yeah, you know most um, even more traditional looking storefronts like I can't remember the name of the restaurant now, but it's got the nice retractable awnings. But we think the glass is too tinted. What's the name of that? That's the Alberto's restaurant. Alberto's. Right. Al Al Alberto's. Alberto's. The 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 window frames are nice, but you know. Just it's just a secret among us all on the call. Those are actually aluminum storefronts that look like wood. So well, that's fine. Yeah. But yeah, the, exactly. So I temporary is the problem. Exactly. Hey, like hey. No, no clear anodized aluminum and no no flat profiles or something. I think we can get the language better there. And and to be fair, Jack, we, the HHTC actually approved those. And but I think what what Tim was trying to make clear before is I, I agree with you. Let's tighten it up. But at the same time, there is the possibility of waiver, as long as we have guidelines that'll back up what should be. Uh, right. The the Alberta's restaurant. I'm trying to remember. I was there for that one, and it was. Um, I think we decided it was in keeping with the character and with the other the rest of the coloring. Uh, and I think what well, didn't everybody pretty much like that? Yeah. Uh, on the picture, yeah. So I think there are ways that sometimes it's, it 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 works. But um, anyway, that's, yeah. that's I, Jack. I, I I think we agree, and we'll we'll tighten up that language. Yeah. yeah. The only other thing I found was that Anderson, Pella, Harvey, none of them have exterior muttons, and in your fenestration, you are asking for exterior muttons. You can't buy them; they're not available. They're all interior or within the uh, two panes of glass, but there are no exterior muttons. So oh, really? Are yeah. you sure? I, I think yeah, we even inspected them recently. I yeah. talked to all of them and they said, we do not provide an exterior mutton. They have a snap-in grill for the interior or they have a mutton set up to go between panes in a thermal pane unit. But they don't do a snap on mutton on the exterior because they get stolen, broken, blah, blah, blah. So they're, they're not available. So might I suggest we, we actually check that? Do yeah, I did. Oh, you, I, I, you know, for, for other purposes. Do yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look into that, Jack, but you might be right. I mean, I, I, I think the, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a question for the whole group. Um, there's something inauthentic about those muttons on the inside. So, you know. Yeah, well, if, if you can't order them, you can't get them. <laughs> because the 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 project that Union Studio designed that we like, um, I forget the name of that. I always forget the name of the project. But those muttons are on the outside of the glazing. Wow, who was the manufacturer of that? Right, right, team. You see, Captain's Row. See, Captain's Row. Yeah. Okay. Right. Everyone should go over there, like Doubting Thomas, and touch the muttons on the outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does it, do any of the commissioners have a problem with my opening it up to public comment so that we have covered that? So I'm going to go ahead and open it up to public comment. Do we have anyone who wanted to make a comment for, from the public? Well, I'll make a couple comments. Uh, basically, this is fantastic. I think this is going to be so helpful. 
um, to help people who are coming in to the community developers to hone their design. So you end up with a with a better product and you don't get some of the uh, the disagreements and the misunderstandings and things that, that make it so troubling. Um, so that'll be fantastic. Uh, one thing I, I, I just, maybe I'm not sure that we've defined who we want to be, what era we're in, what year we're stopping at. Are we stopping at 1920? That's what it sounds like about. Um, I, I just want to, you know, be sure we understand that as as a community where we are in this, what historic period we're going to. Um, like, you know, the Sturgis School is on the on the main street. They certainly have the aluminum uh, doors and things. Are they going to have to then conform and come back? Their buildings don't look at all like that era. And so much of Main Street does have different. I even like the windmill down at the end you know, at, at, towards the West End. I really like that. I think that's kind of cool. And I know last year, um, I don't know if you guys are aware, uh, Nantucket actually fired their entire sign committee over a uh, Nantaco. I think it was signed Nantaco, um, a taco sh store. And there was a bit of a bickering over a sign and they, they fired the entire committee. And I, I think they came back and I noticed on the paint colors, you know, a lot of them say Nantucket red, Nantucket blue. Um, let's be, let's just be careful because we're not Nantucket. Uh, I mean, if we're trying to be Nantucket, that may be a bridge too far for Hyannis. I, I think we have to recognize our culture. I think we're a little more open. We're a little more eclectic here, um, a little more diversity, um, that kind of thing. So that's just my comments is, but maybe a broader understanding of, of what we're trying to, who, who we're trying to, uh, to be on Main Street. You know, what history are we trying to capture? Are we going, you know, colonial era, that kind of thing. Just be a little mindful of that because we are, we are different. We're not Nantucket. Uh, just to acknowledge, thank you very much, Town Councilor Betty Lucky for, for your public comment input. It's always, it's always welcome. Very pertinent. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? All right, so back to uh, the commission and our presenters. Anything more for uh, Tim that? Uh, no, but I maybe I'll um, ask Jim if there is a date by which you would like the commission to um, these were all great comments, but we really love specific advice. Um, and I know that some of you have already um, done your homework um, at an A-plus level, but Jim, is there a date that we are hoping to get comments back um, so that we can, with confidence, move to the next phase of producing the document? And uh, what, are, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, that's that's a great Great timing, Tim. Great segue because uh, yeah, Andrea and I were talking about how to get this developed and and any comments uh, provided before we get over to the planning board because that's our next next stop and we want to make sure that we've we've expressed to them that uh, this commission's had a first stab at it, not a final stab, but a first stab at it and and offered some initial comments. So I think appropriate if the commission's okay with uh, you know maybe July twelfth, thirteenth, kind of the middle of next week. That gives you a full weekend to kind of take it in and and offer any comments. You can direct them straight to me uh, through a, via email is fine, or or stop by if you got handwritten comments. You can stop by the office and hand them to me too. That that works fine. Uh, so maybe July twelfth at the end, end of business day, if you could, uh, that would just be appreciated. So we can get I can get them back over to Util in a timely manner, and then we can go to the planning board, and then we'll be back before uh, this commission. That's a good, that sounds like a yeah. plan. Thank you. And just one editorial comment. If we can go to the planning board and say we've that these reflect the input of the historical commission, not as I, the endorsement is too strong of a word that helps move the process along. Right, Jim? Well, after our next meeting, we may well do a letter of endorsement. So that might help. The, um, I actually, I want to, on behalf of the commission and the town, say thank you for all of your hard work. You've done a, a spectacular job, and it's very much appreciated. 
Absolutely. We appreciate your working with us. And thank you. Yeah, it's been a fun project, and um, we've appreciated the time that everybody has put into it, too. Thank you. Thank you. Did any other, any other commissioners have anything else before I move on? And anything else you need to link? No? Okay, we don't have much left. I'm in a few more minutes, I should think. That was the new. There's no matters on reasonably or matters not reasonably anticipated by the chair, unless there's anything anyone wanted to bring up. Uh, downtown uh, guidelines have done that. The next meeting will be July 19th, 2023. Uh, Karen, what does it look like for that? Do we have a, because we didn't have anyone tonight, so have they been put over? Do we have a full night then already or what? I don't have any applications as of now. I've been out of the office on vacation. When I get in tomorrow, um, I'll check again to see if anything's come in. All right, so uh, closing down public comment. And I do think I think that's thank you to all the commissioners for doing Zoom tonight so that we could better accommodate our presenters. You did a great job. And Jim, you have, you're trying to get, it. yes? Yeah, just one, one final comment before we adjourn. I just want to make the committee commission aware that uh, there has been appeal of the uh, Dockside Marina uh, application, Marina storage application, uh, the denial. Um, and so that will be held, that appeal meeting uh, will be held on July 18th uh, in the evening um, in person. I'll send out the, the agenda that was posted for that. Um, I'll send it out to the full commission so you guys are aware. When did the appeal come in? Please? The appeal for which? Uh, dock side. Which dock, dock side? He has. He has two. The, right, I think so the, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, please. So the the, the recent decision <laughs> that was rendered for the dock side marina storage uh, okay. that was that was appealed in a timely manner. So that will be heard on July 18th, and I'll send out all the information about that meeting to the whole commission. Does that require anything for us? Hear the appeal. Oops, sorry. <laughs> no, we have an appeals committee met. Oh, okay. There's a separate yeah. It's okay. consists of three people. All right. So it's in a timely form, so we've got that. Thank you, Jim, for, for putting that in. Anything else before I ask for a motion for adjournment? No, I see no hands going up. Right. With one of the commissioners, uh, how many have I got here tonight? I've, and you have, we've got some... Just so I know who's voting. One, two, three. I move that we could adjourn. Uh, I just want to make sure how many we've got. So bear with me a second. We got one because we have some alternates. One, two, three, four, five, six. So and that, everyone can vote because seven can vote. So motion for adjournment. I move Second. that we adjourn. Second. So second. Who Second. seconded that? Tom? All right. So I'll do a roll call vote then. Um, uh, Commissioner Kevin Matthews. Aye. Commissioner Cornelius Carley. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Matt Clark. Aye. Commissioner Cronin. Aye. Commissioner Doherty. Aye. Commissioner Jack Kay. Aye. I also say aye. Uh, have a great evening. Everybody, thank you for your input. And